while he's setting up, this is the last talk of the day. So after this, there is nothing more for you until tomorrow. But of course, we have day four. So that'll be great, right? Cooper, how are you? Blah. Ah, works. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm Osh, and I'm going to talk about file type identifiers. Credible. So, uh, yeah, I'm that guy who's been staring at files in a hex editor in, for three decades or so. So when I close my eyes, I see a hex editor, a hex viewer. And I've been a malware analyst for a couple of decades. And I'm known for various stuff, mostly file format or retro gaming related. And, uh, yeah, so basically the idea was like, uh, we are interested at Google in uh, filtering files quickly and possibly reliably. And for that, uh, you start by building a knowledge base and a corpus. And before you can do that, we, you need to classify and validate files and to resolve existing conflicts. So basically, you have to rely on existing engines to do so, or if they can. And so basically, the idea was like, how are existing engines doing? And is there any problem? And basically, the, that's a description of my last year. And uh, if you think I knew about file formats, I, l I looked a lot more at file formats in the last year because suddenly I was not just confronted to what InfoSec is interested, but basically to what everyone is interested in, like the communities of biology, astronomy, physicians, and so on. And that's a mess of messes. It's like we were, visit we were exploring a different mess every week, basically. It's the, the, the quote, what a mess, was just popping every week. So, uh, of course, there were other side questions, uh, mostly because of the virus total output and tier ID, for example, standing out, or also uh, how are file types m mapped on Linux. And I learned that there is a different engine that I thought was using uh, so file, basically libmagic, but that's not the case. And uh, yeah, so basically that was the exploration of just the last year, more or less. And uh, so we're going to cover very quickly uh, these engines, not in detail, just an overview, but this is a, if you, there are some that don't concern really uh, uh, InfoSec in general, like more digital preservation. We will see a few just to see, are we missing something important, you know? And uh, sometimes not. But they have, again, the very different perspective on the file landscape as a whole. So, uh, file uh, uh, scanners, file format detection, and so on. You can call it the whatever you, however you want. Some have a very fixed logic, like you only provide data, which made them quite easy to understand. And some can provide actual code, of course. And then the code can be in just a standard language, in, in, in which case you can express any kind of heuristic, or sometimes it's a very specific syntax, like I'm pretty sure you're aware of with LimMagic. And then there are features that may or may not be a part of the each engine. The, some of these engines have automated signature generation, which could lead to a lot of false positives. And then, in the end, it all matters that are we checking for uh, byte signatures itself, just heuristics, or is it uh, using machine learning? So uh, we want everything, right? We, ke we can keep on dreaming. We want something extendable that is fast and that is simple. And uh, again, it's very important for my audience here to think that some people want to identify files that are not usually the malware vector or the usual, the typical InfoSec stuff. I would say that there are like 80 file formats that are related to InfoSec and a lot more out there that people just exchange on the internet. So if you only care about scanning stuff, you probably won't care about Minecraft maps or Euro Truck Simulator or uh, all this kind of stuff that I had Amiibo dumps, they are encrypted, and so on. But people exchange that and you might want to scan and, or if not, know why you're not scanning them, if possible. And of course, there is always a problem of false positives. Reliability of the engine is just MZP, a valid executable, uh, spoiler for some engine, it is a valid executable. And on the other hand, is an HTML page just starting with small comments still being uh, identified as a web page. So, uh, file, libmagic, I think this is the most known, the most common, started, I don't know when, but at least older than me, uh, version 1.4 was already in 73. Uh, you probably know, you, Binwalk 2 was based on it, Polyfile is a more modern implementation of it, if you're curious, but, you know, you, you, you I am, I'm assuming you're aware of it, right? 
But there are others that are pretty interesting. So tier ID, it's used in various total. And tier ID has a very, has a fixed logic, which is very interesting. Basically, the way you use the tier ID at, uh, typically is that you just give it a file and it will just generate a signature out of it. How? It will just look in the first two kilobytes for by constant common bytes, uh, uh, byte sequence at the exact same offsets and then strings in the first and last five megabytes. So basically, if there is nothing common, then the signature doesn't work. But it can be, it can work blindly, but we'll see that it can easily create a lot of false positives. But that was one of the questions I was curious about when I started this research. Now, uh, just for safe uh, completeness, PID is just actually looking at portable executable files, potentially on the entry point. It's quite old, and uh, and now it's, it's, it's uh, just good for identifying non-polymorphic binary packer. And typically, you, if you download the user uh, database, then you will find a lot of uh, sequence that just to try to reproduce the polymorphism of VM protect, which is a bit dumb, but yeah, whatever. It's old, and just for completeness, it's here. Uh, detected easy, not to be confused, is on the other hand, purely in code, with JavaScript, uh, written in JavaScript. And it's more modern, it's still updated. And there are, it's, the signature set is a bit unbalanced that there are hundreds of DOS detections. And then for, for example, doc files, there are only two kinds of, uh, um, subtypes that are detected. But it's still good and it's still updated and it's, this time it's code. So the similar name, but very different we use. That one maybe you don't know here about too much. The Library of Congress FDD format description document. I, Look at it just in case. A knowledge base of roughly 600 entries. No, no executable at all. It's really for digital preservation library, not InfoSec stuff. There is nothing about, for example, executables or portable. There's no PE or ELF or whatever. But on the other hand, they care about portable embosser format. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's just, it's a different view, right? It's about the different views of the file format landscape from a software perspective. So this is basically, for example, the FDD from the Library of Congress about JPEG, and it just describes some identifiers. So you see, very simple for that part. It has a lot more information, but not exactly what you were looking for uh, uh, if you were wanted to scan or make a filter. Pronoun and Droid. So Droid is digital record object information. Uh, pronoun is a registry. So a bit similar. Another uh, InfoSec uh, DigiPres uh, date knowledge base. And for example, when you say PDB, it's not a program database. So the debug symbol for Windows, but it's of course Protein Data Bank. And uh, then the, the signatures are in XML, uh, and they are very simple. So really not something. I mean just that we know that it exists, and maybe, yeah, we could provide more information, but at least it may not help the InfoSec community. Now, same for PE files. Uh, now, something a bit more interesting. I thought that uh, Linux was, you would, would you use the desktop, would use uh, 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 LimMagic, so file for filtering the, the content types, but that's not the case. And ShareMimeInfo has its own format. It's a bit like LibMagic, but more limited, and it has a lot of, um, yeah, more limitation. We will cover them with a few examples. And it also has a very weird format that is part text and part binary, so the hex is not escaped, so the hex is directly in line, in, bi in binary, in the code. It's a bit weird to view, but just for clarity, you can see that later. We have a few examples. Yeah, very weird of one-liners, a bit like LibMagic, but less powerful as LibMagic. And now, uh, we, so after uh, some, some works, we released um, uh, Magica. Uh, so Magica is an ML-based identifier. So AI, but non-generative, and it returns several file types with percentage, so we released as open source. Uh, there are a couple of implementations, and Magica works on binary, but also on a uh, text source. So like it, it can identify JavaScript, HTML, C, C++. So Magica, Magica 1 was released in February. Magica 2 is just out in August. And uh, so uh, it's very fast. It's, uh, it's now used in production at Google. And uh, it only takes, so it's used by a large uh, email provider, <clears throat> which is handling billions of whatever per whatever. Just to get, yeah, and I didn't leak any information, hopefully. And, um, 
What? No, it doesn't. It, polyglots are not covered yet. No, no. Just so, so the idea was like it's not a deep scanner. It's just uh, here to like in case you put it in, in all the traffic that goes through. Will it help quickly fetch what could be a source file, what could be a protobuf, what could be a protein data bank, or uh, an actual P? And hey, maybe in this case, let's run a scanner on this. You know. So uh, again, not um, some sandbox. I was discussing with people take like minutes per file. This one six milliseconds per file because when you have billions or whatever, well, you cannot spend too much. So a different use case, right? And also Magica is just looking at the first and last buffer of the files, so at least it doesn't grow with the file size. Uh, so most of the file content. So Magica is used in production. There is no validation of the file format, of course. Uh, there is no information extraction. And so far, we cannot make people update it easily. And uh, so it's not uh, 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 resistant. It's not designed to be resistant to anything like polyglots or weird files so far. But uh, I, one of the tricks is just you wipe the first byte and you scan it again, because after all, it's just only an extra six millisecond. So maybe that will give a different output. But so far, that's out of scope, right? That's out of scope. Mag Magica at this stage is not designed to be resistant for any kind of adversarial. And it's not just adversarial. It's even when you have... it's, it's, it's strange on standard files. So when you have a bit of obscure file that still works, not even adversarial, it might just fail. A typical example of that is if you take one of my files that are super tiny and super unusual, even though it's not a polyglot, Magica will say, this has nothing to do with the standard PE, and therefore, because it's machine learning, it will fail to identify the file. So you might say, that's stupid, because you could identify this PE correctly, very easily, but again, that's out of scope. This, one, this thing is aimed at something different. Uh, so, for example, Magica was used in, um, in a CTF flag, uh, where basically you had to bypass uh, Magica identification, and basically uh, TGA uh, images are using a footer, and uh, what, the only solve of that challenge was by ad appending, I mean, putting a TGA structure, and especially the TGA footer at the end of an elf, because then Magica was not ready for this kind of stuff. Okay, But again, uh, basically Magica V1 was like very experimental, I mean, not experimental, but st well, still, like it works and it's useful, and now for V2, we really try to add as many file formats as possible that we could find easily. So basically, right now, uh, it's in the scale, I don't remember, if, uh, like in the th th hundreds of file formats. But again, binary and uh, source files. Like, uh, sorry? Oh, well, one more. <laughs> Uh, so let's look at a few uh, standard examples uh, of uh, file uh, of common cases of stuff you want to identify, and we will see that some uh, engines cannot uh, correctly work on those. So a JPEG file, um, that tattoo is a bit more complex. Uh, a JPEG file uh, starts with FFD8 as a signature, then there is a segment declaration, and then very commonly there is either a JFIF or an EXIF signature out of six. So basically, in many of those files, you have these strings, but it's not a requirement. You could put a comment or this kind of stuff, right? But in a standard case, it's very common to just look at FFD8 and then well, potentially in the strings. And that's exactly what the engines are doing. So share MIME is just looking for the string because uh, the, the hex, because that's only what it can do, right? And that's good enough. But of course, very prone to FPs, right? And potential polyglots. Uh, tier ID, the same. Just, it will say, is there a FFD8 at uh, FF at offset zero? And then, put a, is there, are, there those, are those extra strings present? Note that they cannot be all present, but it will increase the percentage of uh, validity of detection of the file. Now, if we look at something uh, highly undocumented from the 90s, the Microsoft executables, uh, then they start, so it's a trade secret, apparently, uh, known vulnerability, maybe. Uh, it's a, there is a signature out of set zero, then there's a pointer out of set 3C. And then there are potential uh, signatures uh, pointed by that pointer at offset 3C. And the importance here is that some engines don't have the pointer operator, like the share MIME one. So basically, they can only scan the P signature at some a range. And if you take a legitimate reg edit, uh, registry editor from Windows 95, it was a dual executable that had a DOS 
functional code, not just a DOS tub. And uh, uh, so it's an actual executable that had a real DOS payload, and therefore the PE signature is far in the file, because first there is the whole DOS part, and it's a legit, legit file. And this is what ShareMime is doing. It doesn't have the pointer operator. It, can, it only scans the, for the signature in the first 256 bytes. So even your Linux, Linux uh, uh, MIME type identifier will fail to identify that, exec that legitimate executable. Just to say, it's no big deal, but if you don't have the pointer operator, then the, some files are undetectable. Some file types are undetectable. A tier ID doesn't have pointer operator either. It only checks for potential strings that are common. Very simple, but yeah, you know, quite limited. Very po and Limagic can actually look for, so this weird syntax, let's put it that way, is just saying, take the four bytes pointer at offset 3C and see if there is a string at that offset. And uh, also, Limagic is the only engine that uh, uh, allows you to have multiple conditional outputs and intermediary outputs. Uh, you know, so, like, it's an executable, then, oh, by the way, it's also any or a P, for example. Uh, and uh, the doc file, so the old uh, Microsoft Office document, is much more tricky. Okay, it has a fixed signature at offset zero, but then depending on one bit, on one byte version, then you have the sector size that change. Then you need to fetch. So basically, it's easy to identify that it's a doc file. But then, if you want to say, is it a MSI? Is it Excel? Is it whatever? Then it's actually not only tricky, I mean, the, the, the logic is not that complex when you write it, but some engines cannot just handle it. And especially the first uh, kilobytes are just not random shit, but can vary, vary a lot except the signature. So that's not something you could detect reliably. And this is exactly why with TRID, TRID cannot extract the... It just can identify the signature, then it cannot do anything. It's, the logic is too limited. Uh, share mime, same stuff. I don't know why the signature is, has two versions, one of four bytes and one of eight. Uh, yeah, with Yara, you can start to do a bit something a bit more complex, but uh, Yara doesn't have this kind of uh, different outputs. So it's one, year, one rule per signature. So it cannot say, it, does, it, 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 it doesn't have the, the if, it can have or. So you can see it's better, it has the pointers and it has operators, but not there yet. And, LibMagic, on the other hand, despite its age, uh, has the possibility to have functions to uh, move. It's, it's a bit awkward, but in the end, it does the trick. So it's very weird that this one is kind of winning, even though it's a bit clunky, let's put, I think. But yeah, in the end, it can actually it tell apart uh, MSI from XLS by actually checking, oh, is there version free? Then calculate the check, uh, compute the number of sectors and uh, that way. Then you get the right of sets. So not that incredible, but still the other engines before cannot just do it. But of course, this... A Magica only checks the first kilobyte, will not be able to tell the difference, right? I'm not saying that uh, Magica is our savior, he is just different use, use cases, right? So uh, this is the, the, the point of uh, yeah, covering everything and seeing what exists and what is missing. So, of course, when you have a quick and fast scanning, you can easily abuse it. And that's, there's nothing new, right? You can avoid detection either by a corner case, like a very small or very weird phase, uh, file, or uh, abuse the specification. So, I mean, if you're familiar with my work, uh, yeah, I made a few. And or just to put a huge command and make the signature out of scanning range, like for the regedit uh, PE executable. Or you can, the other way around, force misdetection, you put a lot of fake signatures or mock signatures, you can use my tool for that, or just fuzz until the detection the verdict has changed. And again, some uh, in some engine, the order of scanning uh, is important, is it predict predictable? So basically, if you put uh, before, because in LibMagic, the Windows file are in the W uh, file, like the W signature file, then everything that is in database, like if you put a Berkeley DB uh, signature, then maybe your PE will be detected. I, I made a few examples on that in previous talks. Anyway, you, you, I guess you get the idea. And so basically, uh, I made that talk, I made the tool uh, before. So some formats give you full, full control over the first X bytes, some make it 
possible to exploit it's not exploitable content early. ISO, uh, STL, binary STL, DCOM, all these formats have, give you free space to abuse. You can use my tools, Mitra, to insert uh, free space in your file. And you can even use Mocky if you want to just, uh, you're too, you don't even want to do that and just add dummy signatures to your files. So one example that I did some time ago was an empty file that is Mostly empty, just magic and file types, and contains 190 uh, signatures, bin walk and stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, this one doesn't contain anything. Okay, I mean, functional, but it's still detected. It triggers a lot of detection. Or even you can even it, you can even do something simpler and yet reusable that works across different engines. So. Even, for example, file uh, chair ID it can be triggered the same way by adding the right uh, strings and the right signatures at the right offset. And a very interesting example because it's triggering a lot of FPs and it, because it's uh, an old format from the C64. Uh, so this is a printfox file and printfox file, you know, it's, it was on floppy or tapes and the header was just a single letter which in this case is the letter G because it's stand with Gazamp built. And uh, then it's pure data. So basically it's a sign of the time that is a very outdated format, just a single letter and then data with a light compression. But the thing is with TRID, people... So basically the only thing common between two uh, print Fox files are this G. And there was someone made a signature with this G byte at offset zero. And it's in tier ID. And now you have 1.8 1, 1 million of false positive on virus total because someone, so this, this file format, even though it's, now it looks completely outdated, but again, we're talking about a format from the 80s, right? At the time, you would imagine that this format was just limited to floppies and tapes again, and not even your standard 3.5 inch floppies, right? Or maybe it's true. Oh, sorry. But, now someone did a signature, and now this is haunting uh, detection engines because uh, someone put a detection for that. And this is not the only, this is more like a lot of those formats have a very FP-prone signature available. And uh, yeah, if you look at the past, it's a bit awkward and a bit funny. But yeah, that's uh, out of the context of the OS and the system then this maybe format could have been for, forgotten. But now you know why a lot of files on a print fox, it means that they start with a G or a Z or just with the first letter is the only interesting thing. So as a conclusion, uh, different, there are very different engines. Sometimes these engines have knowledge base that is not InfoSec related or some are totally InfoSec related and they all have different goals. They all have their limitations, fixed offsets, pointers, run scanning, some have it, some don't. Some are extendable, some are not. You see, I really wanted to have some coverage on what's existing. Some, are, I mean, only LibMagic more or less, have the ability to extract information, which is funny because again, LibMagic is very old. The quality of the signatures can be the problem. And of course, they can be all fooled by just some standard uh, file format manipulation via my tools or anything else. And uh, the knowledge base and the signatures value are of various quality and scope for different use cases. So the, the, either you want fast scanning or you want in-depth. And in this case, uh, abusing file type detection can be like really trivial. And again, I made tools for that, but I'm, it's, it's nothing new. I mean... It's nothing new. You, you, there are plenty of other ways to do it. And sometimes I assume that if you use a weird compiler, maybe uh, you would avoid the det detection uh, very easily. I mean, very not willingly, but it's just normal thing as long as you're not in-depth scanning. Uh, and without any hype, at least, I, I, I truly think that machine learning really uh, brings something new on the table regarding file format filtering, not your usual limb magic scanning or the in-depth scanning, but it has good impact. It has some, it brings some new results. It outperforms existing solution. It's used in production. It's useful for its own new use case. And it's all because we care, we are careful about a lot of file format overlap. We were, we wanted to, 
you know, like the com some communities contacted us and say, can you distinguish these two formats? And you're like, oh, how are the existing engines doing? Oh, they don't care. Okay, so maybe it's time to bring some difference for those formats and try to help the communities if we can. But again, I think this is also the very start of machine learning in file format filtering, this kind of filtering, and maybe we will do it more uh, prone to adversarial attacks in the future. So many new leads that I'm looking forward to explore. So thanks for your time. And uh, you have any questions? And before the question, if you think this was a world record in number of slides for 30 minutes, it was not. I've seen, I think, do more than 100 slides in the talk. So, so this is actually slow for him, I think. Right? No comment. Thank you. I have two uh, questions, but it's a great talk. So my first question is, I just went through the, your um, mega project on the GitHub repository. Mm -hmm. And I found that you said you could recognize like 216 content uh, file types based on the content. So I'm wondering if some content, we, we can uh, identify them by just setting some uh, rules, not using the machine learning. Oh, yeah. Well, if you want to identify standard files, use the other engines. It's just for, the problem is when you want to train a machine learning tool, then you need a, a, a lot of files that you can legally yeah. train on. So uh, this is what we're still learning how to do. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a problem, right? Yeah, that, that's why I, I had this question, because I think for machine learning, we need to prepare a lot of data yeah. to, to train the model. So if some uh, file types, we can just set some rules. Because the rules we can understand. Yeah. We can be sure that the detection is correct or yeah. the identification is correct. Yeah, you, and you, also only for some or few of the file types we use machine learning. So it can be uh, more accurate, I think. Yeah, you, you basically described by last year on this project. Yeah, writing rules, heuristics. Sometimes it's just heuristic, like amiibo dumps. Woo. Uh, to, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so you write your own rules, you select the files yourself, and then you train on it. Yes. And that content, that this whole knowledge of file selection could be also in an engine. Yeah. Yes, and my following question is about the data preparation for the machine learning model training. Because I think for some file types, we don't have enough data compared to some other yeah. types. So Tot maybe totally. there's the data imbalance. How do you handle this? Uh, well, you just hope that someone will give you, will give you enough file types, and yeah, some, that's why I've been in contact with the info, the DigiPress community sometimes, hoping that they have more files, because, uh, the PrintFox files, I only have like 20 files. <laughs> yes. Yes, so, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a problem, yes, so far, yes, and but solved. When you train the, your machine learning model, you made, you, you, you made sure that your data is worth balanced, or you just put everything there? Yeah, no, we, we look at the validity of, of not, yeah, we, we try to check, of course, but yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how many files that is, that's probably a lot. Okay. I, yeah, I remember downloading, downloading like, uh, yeah, half a terabyte on my, <laughs> on my machine sometimes just to check the files. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. A few. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Because I'm doing a similar work, not on the file types, it's on the programming language. Yes, yes. The, so uh, Magic also handles programming language, so yes, yeah, the same that. stuff. And with funny stuff like uh, MATLAB and Objective-C using .m uh, file extension and yeah. this kind of uh, funny overlaps. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I, I say, oh, last chance, last minute, <laughs> hand. Just a quiz, quick question regarding the file types. Um, are there, uh, um, uh, d did you already, uh, did you also include some um, medical files? Because um, uh, when the coronavirus hit, I was uh, tasked with uh, working on the vaccination application. And there I learned about many <laughs> very strange file types I was never aware of, was unable to find any kind of documentation. And uh, I, I just learned that the medical field has uh, some very, very interesting file types. Uh, 
you would never hear about or uh, uh, anyone even studying informatics n probably never used and never hopefully never will have to use because they are usually badly documented and also sometimes with a very strange uh, proprietary <laughs> extensions so I, I think for, for this, uh, the machine learning part would be quite great because uh, uh, it's, it's very difficult to classify these files. <laughs> yeah, but at least maybe you can identify them. Yeah. Not validate, but at least you can even identify them. But as um, I remember, we only did DCOM for medical one, maybe protein data bank, I'm not sure. Okay. But yeah, every community has their weird weird stuff from the past that they are that they love and suddenly you have to dig in that this is exactly why it was a what a mess every week uh yeah so <laughs> it's not just medical world it's just uh you know like uh, the gaming community uh the what yeah dream maker uh unity stuff uh, yeah whatever <laughs> old stuff new stuff and it's not because it's a modern format that it's not necessarily better <laughs> okay thanks <laughs> Have you looked at the sensitivity based off of like differentiating the same format but created by different programs? Like, do you think if you had labeled data, for example, you could differentiate like a docx that was generated by LibreOffice versus Word, or maybe even like an executable built by Delphi, which we know is probably malware, versus one built by on. you know, something else? So, like, I'm just curious. Like, have you? You know, I would assume that there's going to be statistical differences between them, and I was just curious what the sensitivity would be or if you've looked at, like, more specific, like, applications for attributing the source of those files within the envelope of the format. We don't go that level yet, but it's definitely possible. And again, like, PEID has, uh, or uh, uh, what was de detected easy, have a lot of signatures for DOS uh, and PE stubs. So, yeah, that's definitely doable. Uh, sometimes it's pretty obvious visually, but we didn't go that deep yet. I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, maybe we did for some formats. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, no, it's sometimes it's it's a probably an, an when we handled this case, it was when it was an accidental overlap. Like 3D Studio has the same magic of some T files, but they are actually distinct. So it's actually not too difficult after the signature to say, is it a TIFF or is it a, a, a 3D Studio? And 3D Studio has this 3DS extension like Nintendo 3DS console. So, you know, mess is all in multi-dimensional mess. But yeah, it's, it's definitely possible. We didn't go there yet. And there is already a lot of info that could help, but we, yeah, not, a, not on our focus so far. Because, yeah, next level. Thank you. All right, did that trigger anything else? Or we done for today, maybe? I think we are. Thanks, Ange. Thanks, everyone.